during this lunch break, I made eye-to-eye -eye contact with many of you. And uh, my eye-to-eye -eye contact told me that you have a lot to say uh, that you're suppressing. And it's not good for you to suppress uh, your feelings and your thoughts. So uh, while you've still got that sugar loading on to you, you know, high and uh, uninhibited, uh, how about we start the afternoon with some questions, comments. Uh, there is a, well, I don't see it now. Oh, here. We have a roaming microphone. So anybody who raises their hand will get a microphone. And that means that everybody will be able to hear your voice. Oh, please. <laughs> no. 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 Norwegian. Norwegian. Yes, Norwegian? Yes. Where? Hello? <laughs> that, <laughs> okay, breaking the Norwegian okay. silence. <laughs> um, uh, I was wondering, uh, you started out with saying something about that the status of the borderline uh, or the treatment of the borderline personality disorder patients um, has a problem that uh, they often get inconsistent and sometimes uh, sometimes um, treatment uh, that can do them harm, yes. can be harmful. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that because uh, we all meet these patients uh, sooner yeah. or later. And uh, I have experienced that many say that, oh, I've been to treatment for like four years and nothing yeah, yeah. helps. Well, some of that I'll go into in a, just a minute in terms of getting started, but... Um, Probably the most common problems are uh, when treatments um, uh, are given which are harmful. Those are the more, more explicit. Now, the two examples of that, one I've already alluded to, is psychoanalytic therapies, which are not modified sufficiently to accommodate the needs of these patients. They generally can go on forever and actually uh, make people worse. Um, and secondly, is the use of medications that ma mo many, many times in uh, the United States, and I think elsewhere too, these people are given medications which aren't helpful, but more than that are harmful because of the side effects inherent. When a medicine doesn't work, you get more medicines, and then uh, it also turns the patient's attitude towards their future, depends upon finding the right medication, and it gets them away from uh, the kind of learning experiences which would potentially make them well. So those are the two most obvious ways in which interventions can be harmful. But I, that uh, anticipates what I'm going to talk about right now, which is getting started and then I'm going to talk a, a bit about pharmacotherapy, uh, and then we'll, before our break, I want to cover those things. Um, other comments, though. Um, okay. Um, change is a continuous process. You know, when uh, the empirically-based treatments say you've got to be in DBT for a year, or mentalization-based treatments say you have to be in it for a year and a half, it isn't because you don't get better to a year or a year and a half. Change starts, and you, in your own minds, when you're treating borderline patients, or anybody else for that matter, should start with the idea that change starts from the first minute. That is, it isn't something you postpone or wait for, and then the change will come. You set in motion the idea of change in your first interactions with the patient. Um, it's, and it depends on what's done between sessions. I've already said that. There's an interesting small study done by Uli Kramer, a Swiss psychologist, which took a good psychiatric management and delivered it in a 10-session uh, dose and showed 
not only did it affect positive changes, it uh, compared with patients who didn't get it, but that interestingly that if you are adherent to the basic principles of psychoeducation and uh, that getting started that I'll talk about in a few minutes, that already has benefits. Um, and, it, and building an alliance with the patient during this initial sessions is related to a positive change. Um, I'll be glad to meet you. This is the sort of thing that I used to say to patients. For as long as it takes, you don't want to trigger their fears about abandonment. Um, and of course, I'll meet with you more often if you feel it's necessary. Really accommodating, nice person type of start. Is this a good start? How many like that start? Nobody likes that start. Ah, thank heavens. <laughs> No! <laughs> you, you all recognize I was saying that. So here's the way GPM starts. I'd be glad to meet with you weekly, but I'm reluctant to meet with you more often until we know whether I can be useful. We'll both know that by observing whether you feel better and whether these problems in your behavior and relationships are getting better. That is... How long you stay with the patient, how frequently you see the patient, depends on whether the patient's getting better. That turns the tables on what has frequently been the case, which is the patient's getting worse, you see more of them. You see them more often. Um, and uh, so you want to build, a, you certainly should Start by agreeing on goals and roles. That should be done in the first few months. Uh, liking and trusting each other's intentions. That's uh, the, certainly in the first year. I changed the time scale on this. Uh, when I wrote this, I, I was slower in my thinking than I am now. And the actual timetable for change in my mind and my clinical experience has gotten quicker once... I've gotten the message through to myself and then seen the effects on patients of this uh, introductory thing where change is expected and that if it's not occurring, you, uh, you examine why. Uh, that Just that whole approach to patient care has expedited the timetable for change. So here, early markers of progress. By six weeks, has the patient's acute distress diminished? Now, remember, six weeks at a, a, a meeting, that's like six meetings with the patient. That's a lot. Is the patient actively participating? Do you like each other? Um, by three months, has self-injurious behavior decreased? Does the patient remember what was talked about and apply it to their lives between sessions? Do you feel that your understanding and empathy for the patient has increased? By six months, has the patient assumed or resumed social roles or responsibilities? Does the patient relate their behavior to interpersonal events? Volunteer that without your imposing it upon them. Has the patient's trust in you improved? It doesn't mean that all patients will do this. It means that if patients don't conform to these guidelines for change, you say, I'm worried about whether this therapy is effective. And invite the patient to worry about it with you. My, you say that the, you know, clinical experience shows that um, change should occur, and these are things which, when they're not present, um, make me worry whether maybe something's wrong in the way this therapy is constructed or in our relationship, and uh, let's discuss it. And uh, if... Um, um, 
uh, it may be time to get a consultation. You don't say this therapy isn't working. You raise the question as to whether it's working. By raising the question as to whether it's working, you're letting the patient know that this is not a treatment, this is not a relationship which is non-contingent. This is a relationship which depends upon effectiveness and change. The one thing it is not is a non-contingent relationship. That's quite opposed to the way I and many people of my generation approach psychotherapy with borderline patients where we wanted to reassure the patient that we weren't going to leave them. Um, uh, is that okay with you all? You understand it? It's a very different approach to the start of treatment. I would emphasize one particular thing is the self-injurious behavior decreased. Self-injurious behaviors are one of the first things to decrease. They became a focus of treatments because they're easily measured and they're so uh, clearly a um, um, self-harming, you know, symptomatic act that it was an uh, obvious thing to focus uh, treatment objectives upon. But they're amongst the first things that change in longitudinal studies with or without treatment. If a borderline patient is getting worse while they're in treatment, that in particular should raise the question as to whether there's something wrong with this treatment. It's not like it goes away. It's not that like it should go away. It's actually getting worse, though, on your watch. You say, what's wrong with this picture? Something's wrong here. Ways to build the alliance are addressing the chief complaint. Psych education, which I've outlined earlier, you go over the expected course. You talk about the genetics of the disorder. You enlist the patient's involvement in doing homework between sessions. My favorite, as I mentioned, is getting them involved in the writing their autobiography. But safety plans, um, DBT uses a symptom diary. Um, I don't, but that doesn't mean it isn't a good idea. Uh, writing out uh, analyses of their idea about what preceded some unfortunate event. And emails are now very common. Um, uh, the, uh, incur I encourage them. I think in this model we encourage it. Doesn't, you don't say, I'll respond to it, but you let the patient know that you like the idea that they're working on and thinking about their problems between sessions. It encourages them to think that there's somebody out there who's interested in listening. And... Uh, uh, you don't need to make any promises. In fact, you shouldn't make any promises that you'll read them or respond to them. You'll read them if you have time. You're glad to know that they're working on their problems. Uh, address situational stressors, including getting yourself involved with the uh, significant others. Availability is a big deal. And... Um, let me show you a videotape and uh, on this one. Hello. I know you're back there. He didn't know that I had a videotape. There you are. Okay. You know which one? Uh, managing availability right there. That one, yeah. Besides... I have to take my post-lunch break here. That's when my anxiety is worse. I, I can't sleep. I get in bed to lie down, and then all of a sudden my palms are sweating, my heart is racing, I can barely breathe. It feels like I'm having a heart attack. Well, you know, it sounds like a form of anxiety panic attack. Yeah, uh, that's what the doc said back in the ED uh, a while ago. They checked out my heart and stuff and apparently it's fine, but uh, like this used to happen only every couple weeks and now it's happening more and more and I feel like I haven't had a good night's sleep in 
I don't even know how long, and I definitely am not taking him alone like that. Well, where is Carl? Oh, well... He I, must be out a lot. Yeah, I, I don't get that anxious when he's there. I, I don't even think he's ever really seen me panic. And, and you know, I, I guess you're right. He's been out more and more. I... I can't help wondering that there's some other woman that he's with, or, you know, I, I don't even know, but if you really love me, wouldn't you want to be at home with me at night instead of out? In the so interpersonal model, you're related. thinking that her panic is really caused by his absence. Away, and your fear is that you don't mean as much to him as uh, he means to you. It's just, it's really scary to be alone in the middle of the night like that. I. I do you think that if if I, I had to, if I needed to, I'd call you? Uh -oh. No. I gave you my phone number, uh -oh. and I would want you to use it in the case of emergencies if you needed to talk with me. Of course, what need means differs from one person to another. Yeah, I, I'd only call for really an emergency, like if I wanted to kill myself or something. I know you're busy, and, and you have your own life, and I don't want to bother you. I'd sure rather get called by you than learn that you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? <laughs> he, he laughed. Hello. He laughed. He laughed. And he's never coming back. And I don't know what to do. Well, well, I, need, I need help. Is that, is that I don't, you, I don't need help. Hey. Uh, yeah. Loretta. I, is yeah. that you? Uh, yeah. Just uh, slow down. Slow down. I, I don't, I, I want to understand what's wrong. Carl left. He left, and I, I just don't think he's ever coming back. Well, that's a terrible thought. Uh, I, 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 okay, I feel, I feel better hearing your voice. I, um, I, uh, I'm glad I have you to call, just in case. Uh, well, you don't know. I'm glad you're feeling better, but you know, it is remarkable that you could feel so much better so quickly just after hearing my voice. That's something that we should talk about in our next session. Well, okay. It, yeah, okay. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, I'm going to go try and, and take a bath or something. Well, that sounds like it may be a good way to try to relax. And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. See you on Tuesday. Hello. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I ruined everything. What? What? what Loretta? What, what do you mean? I told you I wouldn't call except in an emergency. And then I called you for something stupid like a fight with Carl. We were just starting to get somewhere. And I think you can really help me. You're the only doctor who's really ever understood what's going on with me, and now you won't want to see me anymore. Well, no, where did that come from? What, why, what makes you think I won't want to see you anymore? Uh, we're scheduled, as a reminder, we're scheduled to meet at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, and I fully expect to be there, and I expect to see you then. Well, I don't know. I just don't know if I can go on like this anymore. You mean... You mean with respect to Carl or with respect to this therapy or with life? What, what do you mean? I, well, I guess the thing that really needs to change is my relationship. But I'm only upset because Carl hasn't come home yet. Well, you seem calmer now. So, again, I'll see you 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Okay? Okay. I'll see you then. Okay, so I think that I figured it out uh, with Carl. So most of the time he's really nice. Uh, he finds me presents, he gets me, gives me little massages after my shift, and he, it's just that when I criticize him at all, he freaks out, and that's when he gets me. And I think the thing is really fundamentally, he loves me so much that whenever I criticize him at all, it. I don't know, it throws him off. And I think, like, do you think it might be because he has low self-esteem? Because well, I've read that when people have low self-esteem, they're kind of... Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. I, this is very important, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but 
You know, what happened the other night when you called me? Huh? Yeah. We need to talk about that. That was important. Oh, well, yeah, um, but I'm feeling a lot better about that, that now. I think the problem is that I need to figure out how to stop Carl from getting mad at me. Because if he's not mad, I'm, then he won't I'm, leave. I'm and very glad and it's important that you feel better. The fact that you could feel better though, so quickly, after hearing my voice, says something that isn't directly related to Carl and has something to do with the meaning that was attached to talking to me. What do you think that's about? Uh, what do you mean? Well, what did you got relief just from hearing my voice. How do you understand that? Well, I was panicking. I was all by myself. And Carl had left. Uh, and uh, I thought he was gone forever. And there was no one there. And then I called you. And, and then there was, you know, there was someone that I could talk to. That uh, you perceived as caring. Yeah, I and didn't. In the, in the absence of that, you were panicky that not only Carl, didn't care, but no one cared. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I I was all by myself, and and then I talked to you, and I I didn't feel so alone. Well, that's very important. You know, it's uh, a vulnerability that a lot of people with borderline personality disorder <laughs> have, where when they don't have anybody around, they start imagining that. Uh, nobody cares about them and or that there's something really wrong with them and they get panicky. Mm -hmm. and this is related to what we've been talking about in your last session too. Mm -hmm. um, so solving the problem in your relationship with Carl is a part of it but really there's a larger issue of your fears about being alone which is something that maybe we can do something about within your therapy. What can we do about it? Well, this is a problem that doesn't change overnight. It should happen slowly. And the most basic way it can change is if you have a relationship with someone where you learn to trust them and feel uh, secure even when they're away. That takes a lot of time. And whether that person's going to be Carl or not is unclear. In the meantime, you don't want your safety or even your night's sleep to depend upon the availability of the likes of me. Um, so we need to th do some problem solving about how else you might cope with this in the short term. All right. So, um, you, lots of people worry that if they take on a borderline patient, they're going to have a lot of calls like this. And um, uh, it can happen, but it is more unusual than you might think, certainly uh, than you fear. Where's my... Um, it's only, uh, I'd say, about a seventh of the patients with borderline personality disorder actually call you most often. Most borderline patients either don't call or call once or twice, and that's it. Uh, whether you make yourself available is not an essential part of any treatment. GP, um, GPM says make yourself available in this way because it facilitates the patient depending on you and testing uh, your, um, avail your trustworthiness, uh, for good for alliance building. But uh, TFP and MBT say use an emergency room or helplines and that's fine. But it usually isn't the kind of burden that you might expect. And certainly the kind of availability that DBT encourages is unnecessary and potentially uh, lends itself to therapist burnout. What this uh, uh, videotape is meant to illustrate is how these uh, calls can highlight the problem that borderline patients have about being alone 
and how you can get that uh, center stage early in the treatment and take it off of the stage that depends in this instance on Carl or on you, but is a symptom of the disorder itself. And that's a very major insight which comes home in a compelling way because of exchanges like this and sets the stage for problem solving which is not going to necessarily ruin the relationship with Carl or um, uh, uh, unrealistically depend on you. Um, you sometimes need, if you have a patient who calls a lot, uh, to set limits on it and that too is not difficult. And then at that point you can revert to the TFP, MBT models of using emergency rooms or helplines. Okay, questions about what I've presented so far in terms of getting started. Comments. There's microphones available on all sides now. You no longer can hide behind the idea, well, I would have said something if I thought I could be heard. Yes. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, Alfreda Kvarstein. Uh, I just wondered, do you practice any kind of written formulation or written crisis plan, this um, kind of thing? Uh, in terms of managing suicidality, we involve patients in trying to create a safety plan, uh, which I'll illustrate this next session. I don't usually do that. I mean, even though we'll, we'll encourage it in, in this presentation, I don't usually, I have not usually done that. Um, uh, I come from a tradition where I have worried that focusing too much on safety actually aggravates the problem. And that can be the case. Nonetheless, I'm persuaded by the now body of clinical opinion and uh, experience which suggests that uh, building safety plans is a good idea. But uh, I do encourage lots of other kinds of activity between sessions. Right here, yeah, Ivan? No, I'm here. I, um, I have been in some of the situations that you demonstrated here with the calls and yes. uh, the SMS and emails and like that. And, um, uh, illustrated very well that the patient get back and then it's been a, a call or that and then the patient won't talk about it talks yes. about other things yes like it didn't happen in a way yes. like you, you this is important you have yep. to yes. you have to stay on it but uh, yes. no, that's uh, that's a crucial thing because yes. i wondered what's happening in this uh, these people that uh, they <laughs> Is the shame, or, or what do you think it's? Uh... Yes, I think it's uh, several things. One is that, uh, as you suggest, they're oftentimes sorry and ashamed that they have bothered you and worried about mm -hmm. uh, it. They don't want to draw attention to it because they're afraid that it'll just remind you how angry you are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that sort of thinking about it, sort of basically an avoidance strategy. Yeah. Um, uh, I also think that um, they, it takes energy and activity on the clinician's part mm -hmm. to underscore the importance of it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the first of these phone calls, this worthy clinician says, you know, this is important. You hear my voice and you calm down. That's important. Mm -hmm. But then the patient may be going, mm -hmm. yeah. All they know is they're feeling better, and they, the content of what you're saying is probably not very important mm -hmm. compared with the fact that you're answering the phone. Mm -hmm. And that in becomes the subject. They will not mm -hmm. have thought that, that what you said is true. It's only that they'll know that hearing your voice was good. Mm -hmm. The importance of that is something that you have to bring to their mm -hmm. attention. It's, you have to be proactive about it. It's mm -hmm. 
not something that they will volunteer or no. know on no. their own. Mm. There's a vast number of people out there. Yes. Oh, no, that wasn't a hand. <laughs> All right, let's go on then. I'm sorry to say. Managing suicidality. Some clinicians will say, I'm sorry, but I just don't treat people with recurrent suicidality. Um, is this a reasonable stance? Well, it is and it isn't. That is... You can understand why people don't want to treat people with recurrent suicidality, but at some point um, uh, it becomes a little um, narrow to refine your practice to those people who don't have recurrent suicidality. It's a major part of being a mental health professional. Uh, and you ought to be self-conscious, if not apologetic, that you have gone through all the training you've gone through only to say that one of the major, pressing, ubiquitous, common problems in the mental health profession is something that you don't want to deal with. You may not be good with it, and that is something that you can only learn from experience, but it's um, not something that you should come to that conclusion or certainly... Um, promulgate uh, easily. Uh, here's a message from the GPM manual. Suicidality, self-endangering behaviors are usually responses to interpersonal stress. I can help you manage these, but to diminish their cause, you need to find better social supports. Risk of suicide is significant. The estimates vary. Um, it's particularly high within the young female. Young females usually don't suicide, so the fact that it is whether it's 3% or 10%, it's much higher than it is in young females. Uh, somebody asked me at lunch to say something about males. As you may know, 50% uh, of the people in community samples with borderline diagnosis are males. This is surprising to those of us who have been uh, confined to clinical situations where Ordinarily, 75 to 80 uh, percent of the people who get treated or seek help for borderline personality disorder are female. The males um, go into frequently go into substance abuse programs or into forensic programs. They are more apt to have hit out at somebody who uh, then puts them in jail as opposed to seeing it as a temper tantrum and is more dangerous when a male uh, gets violent than it is females, and the response by society, including within the clinical uh, situations, is different. Uh, whether they require different treatment is something that is an empirical question. It has not been established yet. A famous football player, uh, Brandon Marshall, um, went public about four years ago saying that he had borderline personality disorder and saying this is a disorder which he was mercifully um, treated for and has made a huge difference in his life. Since he did that, and he continues to do it, he's established a foundation now, um, the number of males that we see in our setting has uh, increased dramatically. He's made it uh, much more comfortable for clinicians and males to identify the borderline diagnosis. And uh, I expect that's something that should continue, uh, if not um, enlarge with time. What differences we need to make in our treatment uh, to accommodate the males is unknown. 
Somebody at lunch told me that she'd looked at um, the males in their treatment center and they did worse than the females. That's interesting, and, but it, it just raises the question whether that's true in all settings and if so, why? We don't know that. I think the studies on longitudinal course, I think Mary Zanarini looked at that in the MZ study, and I think she found that there was more serious suicide attempts, but I don't think that she saw anything else in terms of longitudinal course. Some of you may know that literature better than I do, but that's my uh, understanding of it. Most borderline patients do self-harm, um, and uh, many of them do it repeatedly. Suicidal acts, when they occur, are particularly heart-wrenching because they always seem to be contaminated with ambivalence. That is, they're rarely decisive acts. Uh, a few years ago, the one that I was uh, had some personal acquaintance with was this famous person, um, uh, one of the Kennedys, uh, who hung herself. And uh, what wasn't in the papers was how she had clawed at her neck after she'd made the decisive act of kicking the stool out from underneath her. And that is very characteristic, the second thoughts that people have after they um, have initiated their suicide attempt, and that that is a uh, whole suicide hotline. I've changed my mind. So that the borderline patients who kill themselves, you know, like taking a lethal overdose in a public park, or putting uh, the gas into the car um, at a time when their husband is expected to come home, or hanging oneself uh, in a hospital, these are all instances I'm familiar with, from a pipe that was not supposed to sustain that much weight. Um, they always leave everybody saying, well, if only or what if, you know, the sort of call for help part of it is so transparent that it is particularly painful for people who are either treating them or otherwise uh, loving them to uh, come to terms with in the aftermath. Managing safety is, uh, uh, you always express concern. If a patient, like in this phone call, says, I don't know whether I can continue, so what do you mean? Uh, with your life or, you know, get involved with when the question is raised, even if you think that it's not a serious thing, but get interested and express concern about it. Um, assess the risk. Uh, for most experienced clinicians, this needn't be said, but for junior clinicians or people who don't have a lot of experience with suicidality, it's very common. Emergency room um, clinicians, for instance, uh, you know, it's like pushing a button. Somebody says they want to kill themselves and comes in with a cut wrist, you know, they say, well, then this person needs to be hospitalized. More often than not, the cut wrist has no suicide intention, and the statement, I want to kill myself, only reflects, an, I want somebody, and oftentimes specific people, to pay attention so that if you call a boyfriend in who's waiting out there, wringing their hands in the waiting room, that may be a more of a deterrent to suicide than uh, hospitalization is. So that you need to assess the suicide risk and differentiate um, the, the suicide intentions from those who don't. This is a favorite slide of Paul Links, my colleague, uh, talking about the issues which exacerbate risk and those that diminish it. No surprises, substance abuse exacerbates it. Negative interpersonal events precede almost all self-harm and suicidal acts. Increasing depression, moving into less supportive environments. Um, those are things which precipitate um, 
self-harm, suicidality. Having skills to manage it, a plan to manage it. Uh, having positive interpersonal dose uh, events. Low dose antipsychotics can help. Hospitalizations, those are ways to diminish risk. Hospitalization, simply because like in that earlier slide, you take somebody whose suicidality is usually precipitated by feeling alone. You surround them by a supportive environment and take them out of their stressful situation. You know, five minutes after they've been desperately uh, suicidal in the emergency room, you can see them chit-chatting with strangers in, um, in the kitchen of your inpatient unit. It's not like they manipulated to get into the hospital, it's just that the reasons for feeling suicidal have been met. More support, more external containment, every time. Um, when possible, be available, make yourselves available to talk with people in the emergency rooms or hospitals to diminish the chances that the bad things that they might otherwise do will happen. That is, so that they don't get unnecessary hospitalizations and they don't get the additional medications which are frequently uh, reflexive response by clinicians who are not familiar with this disorder. Yes. To help ER assessments, do you mean for your own patients or just uh, but, but how does it work in well, practice? Well, for, for example, if you know your patient is going to an emergency room, you, you um, talk to the emergency room uh, uh, staff and to help them with the assessment. Um, you you um, don't, um, well, and you encourage your patient also uh, to let the emergency room staff know about you and to have them call you. So sometimes they'll go there and you won't know about it, but when you know about it, be proactive about talking with the emergency room staff. That's what I meant. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, you said something about uh, skills the, the yeah. slide before. You have any specific examples of uh, skills uh, in your model or in your manual? Um, let me, let's see, what, how much time do we have? We have, to, we have until two o'clock, right? Can we get the video on safety management? Managing safety planning, yeah. Great question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have you ever made up a safety plan with a treater before? I don't think so. I don't remember ever doing that. Okay. So I'm going to sort of walk you through it and show, it how, show you how it works. Okay. Okay. So the first, the first step is really to think about um, the things that happened right before you wanted to take the pills in the apartment. So things that sort of led up to the moment uh, before the crisis happened. Nothing really leads up to it. Like, I'm not thinking about it. I just, I was walking to get a glass of wine from the fridge, and the pills were just there, and I, I, I didn't feel well, so I thought I should just take them. So it feels like you don't have any warning? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things we want to do with a safety plan is we want to take that moment where you took the pills and right before to sort of stretch it out a little bit and really look at anything that we can see that happened right before. It's just really overwhelming and I don't, I don't think I think about anything before. It's just, nothing happens. Well, when I saw you in the emergency room, you talked a little bit about some sort of feeling of panic that was going on right before you overdosed. Do you remember that? Yeah. It's really, I feel really panicky, like I have to get out of there, like I can't be there anymore. I just need to do something, like I need a drink, I need, I just can't, I need, I need to do something, I need to get out of there. Okay, so that's good. So that feeling of panic could be a warning sign. Mm -hmm. A feeling of sort of feeling in your body and feeling sort of scared, or, right? Okay. And then um, anything else that happened right before you took the pills? You wanted to take a drink? 
Yeah, I I was overwhelmed. I just needed a drink. Okay, so an urge to drink or a thought that you want to drink. That could be a warning sign, too. So these are the things that we'd write down in step one. You actually just write them down. You're making a list. So step one. Mm -hmm. Warning signs. Feeling panicky, wanting to drink. Anything else you can think of right before? Just like shortness of breath. It's really hard to breathe. Okay, good. That's good. That's a good sign to put that down. These are things you're going to look for. I mean, I want to drink a lot, but the breath is like, I lose my breath and I feel panicky. Okay. This is good. So these are the kinds of signals you're going to look for. Okay. Now, the second step is to sort of think about things you can do when you start to feel those signals at home, things you can do to sort of soothe yourself or comfort yourself in the moment. So let's say you're home, you're starting, you had a bad fight with your sister, you're starting to feel the panic, you're starting to feel short of breath. Mm -hmm. What's something you can do that would calm yourself a little bit? I don't know when I feel like this, it's really hard for me to think about like other things I can do. I mean, exactly, and that's why we're writing it down, because you're going to have it in front of you. My golden retriever. I like petting the golden retriever. Good. Tell me about that. How's that work? His name's Quinny. Mm -hmm. He's really sympathetic, and he's not judgmental, and I just feel a lot better when I can hold him. Okay, good. So put that down, put finding Quinny, petting Quinny. So step two? Yeah. Now the next step is thinking about, are there any people, friends, um, you yeah, know, associates, friends. good. So people that you might call or contact in the moment when things are really difficult. I mean, I have a lot of great girlfriends, but this happens a lot and I don't want to bother them all the time. Well, I, I think that's a good point. And you don't necessarily have to call them because of the crisis. You can just call and say, do you want to meet for coffee or can we go to a movie? Well, we do go to coffee and movies a lot. And they, they, they've known me for a long time and they really get me. So when this is happening, they are really helpful. Okay, so put that down. Um, in terms of contacting friends. And I put specific people, specific friends, things you can do with them. Stacy. Yeah. And their number, so that you don't have to think that. You're not making it up in the moment of the crisis. You've got it right in front of you. Okay. Now, you know, you and I will be sort of talking at these times and working on the stuff as we go, but we want to sort of prepare for the moment when I'm not available. And you really need some sort of professional help or professional resources. You've tried these other things and you really need to talk to somebody else. So who can we think of in terms of where's a good professional resource for you other than me? Like the helplines that people call? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good idea because they're always available. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is I'd put down uh, the actual number. Okay. So look up the number and that's, I'm going to give you that as homework. To look up the name and the number and maybe find more than one. Just as sort of a backup, professional backup. Good. So you've got these different things lined up. You're thinking about um, the warning signs. You're thinking about things you can do to soothe yourself and people you can contact and professional resources. But we should think about you know, how to make the actual home safer for you. Because sometimes we can actually do things in the home that makes it harder for you to do things impulsively. The only person in my home is my daughter. And I don't want, I mean, my sister. Mm -hmm. I don't want her to leave. I mean, I really love my sister. It's just really hard when we get these fights. Right. Well, maybe, that, like, last time I was just going to get a drink, and the medication was just sitting there. So maybe, like, putting the medication away. Right. So making it hard to get to the medication. Yeah. So that's a big one. So, you know, people do that. They buy a lockbox. They get a key. They put it in some high shelf. Mm -hmm. You're just sort of making it harder to do things impulsively. Yeah, I do. So that's a really good one. And we're going to work and on sticky this. notes. I love leaving notes. Oh, you do? Yeah, like on my fridge, I'll just I'll put sticky notes, reminding myself to maybe like call these people. So maybe you can put sticky notes to remind yourself to do the soothing and do the distraction yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Sticky okay. notes. That's good. You want to think about what works for you. The stuff you already sort of already like to do, mm -hmm. so it's not so hard to incorporate it in. So and we're gonna work on this. This is gonna be you know. Going forward, every week we'll add to it, we'll subtract from it. It's sort of I just don't want to tell my mom about this. Oh, yes, yeah, so tell me about that. Because, you know, my mom makes everything, all the stuff worse. So we should actually, that reminds me, when we go back to that second part about who you contact, we should also list people you don't contact. In the Good process. idea. You know, things so that make it worse. Contact mom. Right. So put that down to remind yourself. Okay. Good. Um, and 
then we've got this working document. We're going to work on it every week. We're going to shape it up. We'll add to it. But we should really think about, you know, I should keep a copy of it. So I know. So if you call me, I know what the plan is. You should keep a copy of it. Is there anyone else we should, you know, get a copy to? I think that if I give it to my sister, she'd like that because she gets really mad at me when this kind of stuff happens. So she knows that I'm like, trying to work on it. Maybe I could like ask her for help. I think it's a good idea, and then maybe she could generate an idea from it, too, in a moment. Yeah. Okay. So we'll get a copy to her. Good. Well, this is the this is a really good start. This is the beginning of putting together a safety plan. We'll work on it every week, and uh, you'll look up some of the stuff around uh, the hotline numbers and putting down names of particular friends and bringing them to me, and we'll look at it together next week. Okay. Okay, good. I think it's a good start. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, this is a good uh, example of how you involve a patient in uh, taking care of their own safety. Um, and that's one of the basic principles in working with borderline patients in this area, illustrated by this cartoon. I once had a patient whose husband called me. Uh, she was marching out into the surf off of Martha's Vineyard, uh, and he said she's going to kill, she's going to drown, she's going to kill herself, what should I do? <laughs> I told him he should call 911 and maybe go out and get her. Uh, uh, anyway, these things do happen. She subsequently waited until the police arrived and then came back on the shore perfectly nude and pointed her finger at him as the cause for this. Ah, uh, ask the patient what they think can help. Get them involved. Hospitalize reluctantly. Um, it's a general message. It doesn't mean that hospitalizations can't be useful and you need to be comfortable using them when you don't have other resources, but oftentimes when you do hospitalize somebody with this disorder, you do so with apologies, you know. I don't know whether this will be helpful to you. I just know that uh, uh, I'm too anxious about your safety to do otherwise. And uh, so uh, it's maybe more for my good than yours. And then, as I said about emergency rooms, it's also true if somebody goes into the hospital, try to be involved with the people in charge of the patient's care in the hospital to prevent bad things from happening. Um, I fear you'll become more suicidal if I don't. Am I right? We would both be better if we could find an alternative. Once again, involve the patient. Get the patient to be collaborative about these things insofar as you can. I won't go into this. Clarify precipitants. That is... Assume interpersonal, interpersonal stressors and loss supports. If somebody becomes suicidal, has done something suicidal, don't ask them to tell you, say, be proactive. What happened with your mom? What happened with Carl? Um, you can go into these discussions with some foreknowledge that it almost always will have followed some adverse interpersonal event. Be clear about your limits. No heroic measures. That's a laugh line right there. That's a, so, yeah. And explore the meaning vis-a-vis -vis treatment. As I said earlier, self-harm and uh, suicidal ideation goes away slowly, but Self-harm and suicidal ideation are those things which are 
so clearly symptomatic that they're relatively easy to chart, uh, and they are amongst the first things to go away. And when they don't go away, express concern about it. Talk with patients. Say to them just what I'm saying. These are the things that usually, if a treatment is effective, lessen. It's not like I expect it to go away, but it worries me that I've been seeing you now for six weeks and it has not improved. Or it really worries me that it, it, it's gotten worse. If I'm not mistaken, you've cut yourself three times in the six weeks that I've seen you. Before I saw you, as I remember, you cut yourself three times in the previous six months. Uh, this is alarming. This is very troubling. It worries me. How do you explain this? Is there something wrong with this treatment? And there's this, uh, what we just, uh, uh, and if you have a patient who is actively suicidal and is worrying you, uh, it's always a good thing to talk about it with a colleague. You talk about it actively with the patient, but also talk about it with a colleague. Uh, if you uh, have talked with a colleague about your concerns about a patient's safety, it is the single most powerful thing you can do to diminish the risk of any litigation. In the roughly 15 to 20 years that I have been overseeing treatment programs for borderline patients, we have never had any litigation. We've had some suicides. We've never had any litigation. And uh, in part that's because the clinicians in our programs are talking with other people about the risks and the concerns. If a clinician has talked it over with a colleague and the colleague is, uh, said that they believe that what you're doing is within standard uh, practices and is good practices, the chances of being found guilty of anything negligent in a court of law disappear. In fact, Many lawyers won't take on a case if the clinician in question has talked over the suicide risk with another person. It doesn't need to be documented. It doesn't, you don't need to write things in the notes or anything like that. Just the fact that you were concerned about it and that you talked about it with someone else. Now, if you talk about it with someone else and they said, oh, you've got to put this person in a hospital and you don't do it, then you're, then you're um, liable. But for the most part, if you just got the idea that some independent clinician has looked in on the case and said that what you're doing is uh, good practice, uh, liability disappears. And that's a very reassuring and important thing to learn. Uh, if you uh, involve forensic uh, psychiatrists, they almost always caution against doing anything that might cause litigation, and so I urge you not to get consultations from forensic people. They uh, always urge uh, defensive medicine, and that's not a good practice. There are inherent risks in treating people with recurrent self-harm and suicidality, and you have to be able to be comfortable with that, but you need to also know that what you're doing is okay by general standards of practice. Okay. So, uh, before we start this next section, um, questions and comments. Was that a hand? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, for how long do people with borderline personality disorder usually uh, stay in the hospital after an acute, uh, yeah? How long do they usually stay in a hospital? Yeah. Well, it, of course, varies a lot with what hospital, in what country, mm. how severe the suicidality is. So I don't know about any usuals. In our setting, if a patient's in an outpatient treatment, when they go to the hospital, it's usually a matter of a couple nights. Yeah. If a person does, is not in treatment, and they go in for a suicidal act, then it's more likely to be a week and much of the time will be spent on setting up an aftercare program for the person. Um, unfortunately, uh, many psychiatric inpatient units don't like working with borderline patients and do not have very good guidelines or standards for treating them so that they can easily get taken up with the fact that the patient yelled at the nurse or can't get along with their roommate. And the focus becomes on the problems within the inpatient unit as opposed to the problems that their boyfriend rejected them or that their, their dog died last week, you know. Where, Whereas, and that requires, again, not something the patient is going to present, but which the clinicians need to bring to the setting. What are the precipitants for this? And keeping a focus of attention on the outside events in the patient's life and addressing those. When you do that, then the patient's disruptions within the inpatient unit become far less uh, likely and far less significant. And the aftercare is going to follow from it much more smoothly. Yeah. But it's just not easy for inexperienced units to do that. No. Um, can it be harmful for these patients to be uh, hospitalized for too long? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple harmful things in being hospitalized for too long. One is that uh, hospitals are essentially an asylum from life. And the good part of that is it allows people to sort of regroup, settle down, and think about what's going on under circumstances where they were overwhelmed by stress when they were outside. It becomes bad when it becomes something that is uh, an asylum that they uh, want to use to avoid life. It becomes an avoidance strategy. And uh, it becomes addictive, that it's the only place in the world where they get all this attention and no responsibility. So um, it's very easy for that to happen. Um, much less so now than it used to be 20, 30 years ago when um, uh, long-term hospitalizations were much more common and sanctioned than they are now. I'm getting back to you uh, concerning the uh, emer emergency emergency room issue because um, uh, I don't think that's uh, common practice that uh, here in Norway that um, uh, when the patient is um, admitted to the ER because of uh, an overdose that the therapist is contacted uh, maybe if it's during yeah. Daytime, um, maybe, but but it, uh, I never, I've never done that. Yes. Um, but maybe it should be a common practice as well in Norway. I don't know. No. Yeah. Well, well, the comment was that here in Norway it is often, or it's unusual for emergency room uh, clinicians to contact the uh, patient's uh, outside therapist, and. Uh, that may be the case, it's unfortunate. Mm. Um, you can ask your patient to try to make that happen, whether it happens or not. And uh, 
There is also an issue, I think, of education. Um, a young psychiatrist from the University of Michigan has recently written a, an appendix to the Good Psychiatric Management uh, Manual, which is being published about emergency room um, treatment of borderline patients, about good psychiatric management in emergency rooms. And he is I himself now on a mission that accompanies this one of going to emergency room staffs and um, giving them guidelines about what they should do uh, in re when borderline patients occur. For the most part, emergency rooms in the United States don't like, they actively dislike borderline patients and they treat them with hostility, masqueraded as medications or hospitalizations to get them out of there or getting them out of there without any aftercare so that yeah. the, their, the treatment borderline patients get in our emergency rooms is usually pretty lousy. Uh, his uh, statement is uh, that it's not that hard to do with the same amount of effort to do something very, very good. And uh, so uh, I can't uh, give you the reference to it, but uh, it'll, it's, it's, it'll soon be published. And okay. it's definitely a problem. It's definitely a problem. And that's one of the problems with the uh, transference-focused psychotherapy and the mentalization-based treatment models, which uh, say, you know, if you're have a crisis, go to an emergency room, or call a hotline. Uh, it's uh, definitely better for the clinicians, but uh, the things that can go bad when people get into emergency rooms are, you know, they're, they're bad things that can happen, often do. Okay, we'll start on Oh, you are going to speak about this. This is Dr. Bjorn Osberg. Yeah, from yeah. <laughs> you are going to speak about the family later, but we even yes. would, would you even allow some of the family member to contact you during crisis, for instance, emergency room episodes and so on? Oh, sure. The question is whether you would allow or encourage family members to get in touch with you if they're family member is in the emergency room. Absolutely. No, I didn't, I overlooked that, but no, absolutely. And that, I haven't talked about that yet, but within this GPM model, it's not like you've seen the patient and you don't see the family. You definitely want the family to know who you are and to have access to you. 